Hi, and welcome to today's episode of Piano TV. I am Alicia, your host, and today we are going to start talking, our slow progress of talking about Edward Grieg, who was a Romantic era composer, and he generally doesn't get as much of the spotlight as other famous Romantic composers like Chopin, Liszt, Brahms, but he's well worth discussing, especially if you're a piano player. Now, throughout the next couple months, you'll see us post some Grieg videos. We'll talk about the easiest piano pieces if you want to get started playing Greek music. We are going to do a brief history video on him as well, so stay tuned for all of that. But what we're going to be doing today is I picked four of his pieces that I feel represent his repertoire just to kind of get you started. If you've never listened to Greek before and you don't know what to listen to, this can be a guide for you. And we'll play through examples, I'll talk about the pieces and stuff a little bit, and we'll just have some fun. Let's get started. In this video, we're going to start by talking about what is Grieg's arguably most famous work, his Perjunt Suite. So I'm not a Norwegian speaker, you'll have to bear with me. Perjunt was played... Perjunt. Perjunt was a play by Henrik Ibsen in 1867, and that's what Grieg's music was used for. So he kind of did like all the orchestral music for the play. The play premiered in 1876, and then several years, Grieg extracted the music from the play and released it in a set of two suites. The first suite is the one that is the most famous because it has two pieces that you've almost definitely heard before. We're going to talk about one of them. Um, Morning Mood, which we've done a piano tutorial on this at about like a grade one level. So if you're looking to learn this one, we have that linked in the blog below. Um, and also in the Hall of the Mountain King, ba, 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 ba. I don't know why I'm saying it. I'm gonna I'm gonna show you the audio recording of it right away. I enjoy what Grieg wrote about this piece. For the Hall of the Mountain King, I've written something that so reeks of cow poo, ultra Norwegianism, and to thyself be enoughness that I can't bear to hear it, though I hope that the irony will make itself felt. Another work of Grieg's that you've probably heard before, even if you don't recognize it by title, is his Piano Concerto in A Minor, Opus 15. It was written in 1868 when Grieg was young for, I guess, fairly average age for a composer, but he was 24 years old. And like many concertos, it's a larger work. It's a little bit longer, 20 to 30 minutes. I can't remember exactly how long this one is, but it's in three movements. This is actually the only piano concerto that Grieg ever completed in his lifetime. And to this day, it remains one of his most popular works and one of the most popular piano concertos of all time. Interestingly, Robert Schumann, who was a contemporary of Grieg's, had a piano concerto in the same key, and just like Grieg, it was his only piano concerto that he'd ever written. So the two are often compared to each other, and uh, in the sense that they have similarities, but Schumann's came first, and Grieg's was kind of like the next, the next one. So Grieg was really influenced by Schumann when he wrote it. He heard Robert Schumann's wife, Clara Schumann, perform it in 1858. And after hearing that, he was heavily influenced by it. Um, and another thing that would have influenced his Schumann-like piano concerto was the fact that he was taught piano at one point by one of Robert Schumann's friends. So there's a lot of tie-ins tie and it's not a surprise that there's a likeness. A couple more fun tidbits about this piano concerto. In 1870, Grieg traveled to Rome to meet up with Liszt and then Liszt in front of a group of people at a piano party proceeded to sight read the entire concerto and then had very nice things to say about it. Another interesting fact is that this was the very first piano concerto to ever be recorded in 1909. Now due to audio limitations it was a really short version but still. Grieg continued to revise this piece throughout his life right up until he died. He didn't just write it and then say like okay done on to the next thing. He kept working through it. The version that we know and love now was completed mere weeks before his death. Grieg's Norwegian roots can be heard throughout this concerto such as in the introduction. Here we see notes in groups of three. So you have like a minor second paired with a major third. Ba -da -dum, da -da -dum. Uh, and this is like a common little musical feature in Norwegian folk songs. Just one little example. So let's take a listen to this intro.
The next piece we're going to talk about is from a collection of Greeks called Lyric Pieces for the Piano. And if you're a piano player and you've been playing for any amount of time, you've probably come across these. They are standard repertoire for the intermediate to early advanced students. His Lyric Pieces span from about grade 5 to grade 10, and they're just they're lovely little short pieces in a variety of uh, styles, some are fast, some are slow, some are happy, some are sad. They're just, they're really diverse, they're really interesting, they're very engaging, and they're a great warm up to some of the more difficult romantic composers like Liszt. There are 10 volumes of lyric pieces with 66 pieces throughout the 10 volumes. It's like having basically 10 albums. Um, and that's just like one small sliver of his composers back in the day wrote so much music, it's mind boggling, but that's a whole other thing. The lyric pieces were published between 1867 and 1901. And I'm going to show you a little bit of the most popular, what I consider to be one of the most popular lyric piece pieces, and it's the Wedding Day at Trollhagen. It's the sixth piece in the eighth book. So it's Opus 65, number six, if you're interested in it's a grade nine level piece. Oh, sorry, it's a grade 10 level piece. It was originally titled The Well Wishers Are Coming and was written in 1896 to celebrate 25 years of marriage between Greg and his wife, Nina. The first section of this piece is really lively and pretty much exactly what you'd expect for the title. Jolly, optimistic, and then the second section, which we won't listen to today, but I encourage you to take a listen yourself, is much more reflective. So let's take a listen to that very recognizable first little bit. Let's have a look at Grieg's Violin Sonata number no. 3 in C minor, opus 45. This was the final violin sonata that he ever wrote, and actually the final piece that he ever wrote in sonata form in his entire life, towards the end of his life. It was begun in 1886, and it took him several months to complete. It's the most popular of the three violin sonatas that he wrote, which is why I'm sharing it with you. And another reason that I'm sharing with you is that it was one of Grieg's personal favorites. And I always think it's fun to share the music that the composer themselves really enjoyed of their own music. The premiere featured Grieg at the piano, and this might not be a surprise to you with all the piano music he wrote, but he was a gifted piano player. And he played along with the famed Adolf Brodsky on the violin. So what we're gonna do is listen to a little bit of the first mu movement, movement with a very like loud, heroic introduction. today's video on Grieg's music. I hope you enjoyed it and maybe you were surprised if you'd recognized more of the music than you thought you might have. Grieg has a lot of pretty well-known pieces that you wouldn't necessarily know that you knew if that made any sense. Anyway, thank you for watching. Stay tuned for more Grieg in the coming weeks and I'll catch you guys in the next video. We're gonna look at Grieg's violin sonata. <laughs> Why did I have problems with the nerd sonata? sonata?